so it's a very special afternoon for me. I've got Graham Say in the back of the ute and he is founder of Nutritech Solutions. And I first met Graham in Greenmount nearly five years ago now, like four and a half years ago. Uh, he was talking with Professor Don Huber and um, uh, Jeff Bassett and Sarah Fee organised the event and this is sort of how I got to know Graham and I sent him an email because I'm quite forward like that. <laughs> sort of saying how we all need to do our part with this regenerative farming side of things. Um, Graham, you sort of... Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, you you classify yourself as an educator, yes. then a writer, yeah. then a farmer, yeah. and then a businessman. Yes, that so order. You're a pretty astute businessman, though. Like when you're talking, and it's great to hear in these conferences or field days that you actually know the price of things, so that you can break it yes. down. And um, so, just tell us why you started Nutritech Solutions. Um, it was actually a bit of a life-changing scenario where I had a daughter who was hit by a car, you know, a six-year-old who was horrifically decimated and brain damaged and died twice on the way to hospital and then lay in a coma for three months. And uh, it was one of those scenarios where just sitting there holding someone's hand hoping like hell is, is, is life-changing in its own right, but, um, you know, she was only ever going to be a vegetable according to the specialists and they tried to get us because she was an organ donor to agree to um, you know someone wanted a rise and someone wanted a kidney and whatever other harvestable organs that was really horrible times to say the very least and uh, there came a point at which she stabilized which was great but didn't sort of stay in the coma and then suddenly all the machines she was connected to started beeping at once and um, they said this is brain death approaching this is what always happens all the pressure builds and the brain dies uh, and so I'm not conventionally religious, but I do know there's something there. And I, for the first time in my life, I made this kind of deal. I'd been, you know, quite, you know, I was an A student when I was at university and I'd been quite successful in business. And I developed this little bit of a passion for understanding the soil, which was very much in its embryonic stage. But I made this deal that should she survive, I'd do something, I'd give back, because I hadn't given back. I mean, I hadn't literally ever been on a board or, don't, or maybe I might have given a few things to charity, but I really hadn't helped any, I hadn't done any community things. I just looked after my family and myself and lived a kind of charmed existence at that point. And so I made this deal that that would change and I'd do something of value. And 20 minutes later, she came out of the coma. So that thing of value is, you know, she made headlines as a miracle child, how could it have happened and so forth. And I had a sleepless night and come up with this concept that I would develop this expertise. I didn't know what to do initially, and then I thought, well, should I have got this passion? I started thinking about how important the soil was and this recognition we are what we eat, and what we eat comes from a soil that's a shadow of what it used to be, and thought, well, I can, you know, I can develop this expertise in soil, animal, plant, and human nutrition, which is what I've done, without degrees in those subjects. I've got degrees in psychology, sociology, of all things. Um, and it's been a better place to come to it if you can because I mean anyone can self-teach anything now you can just read the papers and read the books and in my case interview some of the key players and, and learn from them um, but but you're actually in a better position not to have precon not to be pushed into a thing where this is what it is you know you watch what happens pe to people a year into med medical school and they just think that the, all of the uh, regenerative or all of the nutrition stuff is nonsense because they didn't get any of that they got what they got and it's kind of an indoctrination that doesn't really serve you well and so coming up where you could just look uh, at everything and say, see it for what it is and then discover how you can do it better that was a far better place to come from yeah, yeah. so your opening line that I had to write down was the perfect blueprint called nature Yes, and so it's very much, I mean, the, the, the definition of the word science in Webster's Dictionary is, if you check it, it's adherence to natural laws and principles. That's what, that's what we've got is this perfect blueprint called nature that we were supposed to learn from. And we have taken this kind of arrogant, it really is a, a blind arrogance to, to say, oh, we can do better than nature. And we're staring down the abyss through that arrogance uh, with the mistakes we've made. I mean, nature is there as this wondrous interrelated marvel that we understand really so little of at this point but everything is about learning from nature and working with that natural system and we went the opposite way we there was more money and uh, coming up with, with uh, techniques to treat symptoms rather than getting back to root causes and so this thing that I've developed called nutrition farming is essentially about working with the natural system much more efficiently working with nature rather than against nature uh, and that's pretty much how it's how it's evolved.
Yeah, and so then after that line, you mentioned dumbing down nutrition. And we've pretty well done that with farming and with our own health, haven't we? Well, the very simple thing was that the first cell that oozed from the Precambrian Motion had 74 minerals. And in a perfect blueprint, there aren't mistakes. You know, 74 minerals, there's 74, they all do something, and we've yet to understand many of them. But, but um, increasingly, we're finding things like a couple of rare earth minerals at the moment have been tested in Western Australia for seed treatment. And you think, how on earth and why, why would they be punching out this much more vital plant when we've never, ever acknowledged that they did anything? So eventually, we'll realise the role of everything. But, and every time you take a crop from the field, and this is just common sense, but every time you remove a crop, uh, you remove a little bit of those original 74 minerals. Uh, and originally when you had a kind of integrated model where animals and so forth, there was this recycling happening so that it wasn't quite so extractive. And then this German chemist called Justice von Liebig burnt some plant material. And when you take 100 kilos of plant material, you have five kilos of ash. And that's the ash contains the minerals in the crop you grew. And with the rather crude technology that he had at that time, he analysed the ash and determined that it predominantly consisted, because he couldn't really measure much else, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. There were a bunch of armaments factories uh, free at that time that could make these, this nutrition in a bag. And people thought all the things we've always done of green manure crops and animals built into the cycle and spelling paddocks and, and, and manures and all of these things that we've always done in agriculture, uh, suddenly we didn't have to. How easy is it? We just put it on from a bag. And so we began, and of course, to understand you had a site recycling of everything uh, and now suddenly you're taking off a little bit of everything with each crop, even if it's milk, you're taking off a bit of everything and you're putting back three things as what we started with, NP and K, and then gradually we said, oh, maybe we need a bit of calcium or a bit of, a bit of uh, magnesium or whatever. And more recently, perhaps we're realizing we need sulfur. And then, of course, we've got all the trace minerals. And of course, we talk about major minerals and minor minerals as if trace minerals are this little minor thing. But the reality is that they're there in much, much smaller amounts but they're critically important for hugely important processes like photosynthesis and they're spark plugs that trigger those things and we neglected those things. In fact, we mined them ceaselessly when we took, took out a little bit of everything and put three things back and that's all we tested. And if you look back, what you find is that it's about 12, 10 to 15 years, 12 years, that we started to see pest and disease pressure, the likes of which we'd not seen previously. And rather than asking the question, is there a link to this nutrition, which of course there was, <laughs> Um, we, the science stepped up to the plate and said, look, here's a bunch of, of, chemi of chemistry that can solve your problems. And so we began our 10 decades of chemical agriculture where we treat symptoms with chemicals. Uh, and what you need to know is the unsustainability of continuing that. And this is not some simple statement. This is 14.7% increase in chemicals last year, 14.4, 14.1, 13.9 the year before that, 13.6, 13.2. Every year for 10 decades, more and more chemicals into the equation, into our soils, into our food, into our children, which recent studies have demonstrated. Uh, but wait for it, every year for 10 decades, uh, we put more and more on, and every year for 10 decades, there's more and more pest and disease pressure on a global level. You might say, oh, I used the fungicide and worked on that particular disease. We're talking about the global picture is more and more chemicals every year. And that's more and more for less and less response, which is the literal definition of unsustainable. You just can't keep doing that. Yeah. Uh, and we are, and so we need to change that. And so if there's a better way we can do it, uh, we certainly need to be looking at that better way. And that's what this regenerative approach is all about. See, what fascinates me most about everything that I hear, because you are an encyclopedia of knowledge, it, it is phenomenal how much information yeah, it's a bit that of a you are able to circus put out freak, there, isn't it? is the fact that you are 100% anti-chemicals. Yes. And you are walking the talk by proving to yourself more than anything that you can do it without chemicals. However, when you are talking to farmers who are in this transitional stage, you do have to mention about adding stuff and what they can add. And it fascinates me how your mind can switch between both because I don't have that indo indoctrinated position from, from, I haven't been educated in the agricultural way. So I sit there and it's like I switch on when you talk about the cover crops and, and the fungi will improve the calcium uptake and things like that. Yeah. And then as soon as you start adding phosphorus, nitrate or whatever, <laughs> I, I, whoo, it goes straight over my head because I've never been educated no, that way. That so how do you, I mean, of course, it's all 
it, you, you, you well, need well, there's, to... there's a couple of things that need to be clarified immediately is that when we talk about um, chemicals, we're talking about fungicides, pesticides, herbicides and nematicides. When we talk about calcium nitrate or some kind of phosphorus or whatever, they're minerals. They're, not, they're just minerals. They're not. People say, oh, you know, should I buy my zinc uh, you know, pay $40 for my bottle of zinc, which everyone should take on a daily basis to boost their immune system because most of us are deficient in that trace mineral. No, you don't have to. It's just a mineral. You can't make it. It's a mineral, you know. It's a mineral and everything comes back to minerals. When we talk about making food our medicine, the very mo most important thing to understand is that the precursor, the building block for everything, whether it's a vitamin or a phytonutrient or a, an enzyme or whatever, everything comes back to minerals. So. That story of balancing the minerals is an integral part of how you produce good food. We've mined those minerals out, we need to put those minerals back and there are varying ways you can do that. And so this doesn't have to be organic, there are quite sustainable conventional inputs. You can make them more sustainable and that's very much the pragmatic approach. Uh, it's, the, it's the farm chemistry and when I say I'm against it, I wouldn't use it on my farm. I wouldn't use a fungicide, pesticide or herbicide, I'm just saying I, I have to prove to myself. See. Farming is the most important profession. There is nothing, making, producing food, there is nothing that comes close to that. But the person that can do that, so here we have the greatest profession, but the person who can do that with the minimum crutches, because what, chemi what chemical, farm chemicals, this isn't minerals, this isn't calcium nitrate or whatever, this is farm chemicals, they represent crutches because you're not good enough. Uh, so basically for me, I've failed if I can't do it. You know, so the guys that the guys that do organic by neglect and produce this pathetic stuff and sell it because they didn't use chemicals, that's not my model. The guys that can equal the yields or out yield the conventional guys working with the natural system more efficiently with no crutches, they're heroes. They're my heroes. They should be on the front page of all the magazine where those worthless celebrities currently adorn. That should be where they are. And they will. At some point they will be because that's how important this thing is yeah. and this recognition is coming through. And so for me, I have to prove that. I have to, on my farms, you know, I have to be able to show that I can deliver at least as good. So I'm so thrilled with my large apple farm because I chose apples because uh, apples are basically the most toxic of all fruit. They, I shouldn't say it, but I mean, there's a dirty dozen list published in the US has been for the last 17, 19 years. Uh, and apples make the top five and have made number one many times because the principal pests uh, Cosling moth and fruit fly and varies in different countries but you have to use systemic insecticides and there's lots of fungal problems as well so there's, there's fungicides uh, and so that's in the meat of the apple you're eating so if you do nothing else at least buy something organic for your children as far as the apple a day makes the doctor stay if it's a poisonous one. So, so <laughs> I that one. Yeah, yeah, I just thought of it then. But, uh, but basically, uh, so I took on the hardest thing, a completely chemical farm, because we've got techniques that can, can detox and pull out the chemicals and build, bring back the biology, and I wanted to prove that. And, you know, it's been no small challenge, but we're in our second season. And we, last year we made cider, apple cider, two varieties, and we put that cider into the National Cider Awards. Actually, it's a global thing because the people from all over the world put that put in there, and we got second. And the winner was a very, very famous Italian cider. So being second puts us really as the best cider in Australia and New Zealand. No one's won a medal first up. No one from Queens has ever won one. That's nutrition farming at work, and I was dancing in the streets, <laughs> you beauty. And that we put we two, two of them, and we won two medals. So, you know, and no one's done that first up, let alone some from Queensland. So... Yeah. So that was, you know, testimony to the value of this nutrition farming approach where you are looking at minerals, microbes and humus and how those three things interplay and you're doing leaf tests and soil tests and you're giving the plant all the best of everything and creating this food with forgotten flavours and extended shelf life and, and much greater medicinal qualities and that's, you know, really trying to create food that is supposed to be our medicine and to do that the best you can do it and it's a very, very honourable profession mm. and wonderful to be part of. And I love the way that you are not scared to experiment. No, you do. Well, that's what it's about. You've yeah. got to, you've got to, um, but, but having said that, um, you know, I'm lucky that I've got a company behind me that I can, I can sustain a few losses. And I really feel even more so having been involved on quite now on a larger scale in agriculture that uh, you really feel for the people who haven't got the backing, you know, you have to do something wrong when you've got, you've got a backup, you've got a company you can fund it sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but when you haven't, I mean, it makes it quite scary to try anything new and that's very much the position for a lot of people who think, well, I, I've got a model, I know it's not sustainable, I know my soils are getting worse by the year, 
but I've got a mortgage as well and what I am doing at least I know it's covering the mortgage and you know, you're telling me to do something completely different and take a gamble and I can't afford a gamble. Yeah. And so very much part of the approach is saying, okay, it's just step by step and you find if you can do this, that will make you more profitable and you can look at doing this and whatever. Yeah. Um, there's no, you shouldn't be doing this, there's no condemnation ever. It's you did what you thought you had to do, but there might be something you can, some way you can do it better and if so, we'll teach you how that works. Yeah. No, and, and I think that's what everybody really appreciates when they come on one of your courses. And so what do you offer then? Because you've got a five-day course coming up. Yeah, so we do courses. I mean, typically it was all over the world, but with COVID that's changed a bit. So we do a lot of, I do a lot of lo online Zoom consults um, with growers from all over the world. My podcast has become something of a phenomenon globally. Um, people <laughs> listen to it so much that they you almost become part of their family because it's in their tractor, it's in the car, and they're just <laughs> listening. And, they, and because listening to me talk is like drinking from a fire hose is what people commonly say so consequently there's you know you, you can listen several times and you can absorb this huge amount of information and so people it was something i should have done years ago and didn't even think of but yeah. the podcast has become quite a driver and so we do um you know courses around the country and so forth where you're allowed to go if you're not vaccinated and i'm not so <laughs> that limits some of the stuff but um so what's your podcast called it's called the nutrition farming podcast Okay. Yeah, so it's like it's in, you know, it's in the top 10 in a lot of countries in terms of educational podcasts. It's become really, really popular. So it includes soil health uh, and human health and humour and interviews and recipes. And it's really quite, uh, quite a package. Um, you know, I've got this kind of larrikin Australian humour. So there's always a, se a series of jokes in there, some of which are fairly dubious. And some of the more politically correct people struggle a bit with that, but that's who I am and what I do. So, where you know, get a get a sense of humour, you wanker. <laughs> no, <I'm> just... <laughs> um, and the other thing I'd just like to touch on as well is what is is happening in India with it's the test with the food quality test or something. What's it called? Um, no, I was mentioning that part of the game change, because we're seeing really, really large organisations that are suddenly wanting to learn this whole regenerative approach, this what I call nutrition farming approach, and part of what drives those people isn't necessarily a concern that their consumers, people with you know, six and seven billion dollar turnovers are now heading down this path. Part of that is this recognition of a really major change that's almost upon us. There are three different technologies, right, one of them's almost there, that basically will allow us to, as a consumer, walk into a supermarket, uh, shine a laser connected to a mobile phone uh, at the food and get a complete analysis of both the minerals and quite soon the chemi chemicals that are present in that. So what that means is effectively is that the cat's out of the bag. You can't have cornflakes with 11 chemical residues when children are eating it. Yeah. And so all of those things that we've been doing, that industrial agricultural model, pouring more and more chemicals on for less and less response, now everyone knows about it. Yeah. And they can just check it and then they put it on social media and the whole world knows it. Change has come, change is coming and it's coming quite quickly. Right, okay. Yeah. So there isn't actually, I, oh sorry, I thought I was on, under the impression that there was actually a test that you had. Um, there's a there's a, a a company called a company called a Bionutrient and I, an Alliance I think they're called um, something like that that have got a meter that's out there now, but that's the first of three technologies that are on the, that are almost there. And one of them's there, okay. and that doesn't do chemistry. That just does the mineral mineral or the you know the nutrients does nutrient values, um, not the chemical residues. Yeah. The chemical residue has been hard to get through because everyone's stomping on it because it means that brings in such a change. Yeah. 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 So if I'm, or, and I am, starting to grow regeneratively, I don't want to be certified, um, but I need to be able to verify what I'm doing with improvements. So is there something... Oh, so, so yeah, what you were referring to, that was, this, this is so, uh, as an alternative to, to um, organic certification, we, we actually have a nutrition farming certification that's just begun in the coffee industry in India. That's what you were referring oh, to. Oh, okay. So I'm sure you mentioned it. Yeah, so I've developed <laughs> a, a series of, you know, a tw a 12 or 13 uh, parameters that have to be met. It includes basic things like, so, so the, my, my concern with, with conventional organics basically is that you've got a system where it's a manual of everything you can't do. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. And there's not, there's barely a sentence about what you need to be doing 
to produce food with forgotten flavors, uh, you know, lack of chemical residues and, and more medicinal qualities, which is what food production should be about. So nutrition farming and that certification, which we've only begun in that one country at the moment, uh, is all about 13 things that you need to do to do that and you tick them off and if you haven't done them you don't qualify but if you have done them you will produce the best food just like the apples of mine that you tasted recently so even if you're in your first year compared to somebody who's in their fifth year yeah you're still qualified yeah, if you've done all of the things that are required yeah, yeah. perfect that's yeah. exactly what we need so you need two leaf tests and you need to have shown that you acted upon those leaf tests and are based upon our approach where we try to maximize four minerals to give you maximum photosynthesis and all of those kind of things yeah yeah, so. Is that available in Australia? Not yet, but perhaps at some point. Okay. It's just that it takes so much, you know, someone's got to go around and audit that that's happened and okay. we just haven't, we're struggling to keep up with the demand for everything we do around yeah. the world anyway, so, yeah. okay. so that's, that's what slowed it down. So someone's doing it on our behalf in India, so. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to, to add? No, that's, that's, that's right. Thank <laughs> you. You've, been, you've literally been talking for three days. <laughs> yeah, no, my, I know my voice is starting to get a little bit gruffy at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for, for actually spending some time in the back of my ute because I, I always, at the end of these sessions, like people are exhausted. So. No, yeah. that's fine. Pleasure. Thank you. Okay, I'll hit the highway now. <laughs>